Danny Bourne in the dead ground. <laughs> so happy. Why are you that's laughing a, then? Because obviously what you just said before when you were like, what's your second name? And then I was like, it's Bourne. You were like, ah, yeah. <laughs> um, what were we talking about then? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, like training and knowledge. I think, you know, I was thinking then when we were talking on, on the icebreaker about what you, you were saying about getting through life-threatening situation. I think like that, you got the fight, fight, flight or, or freeze, haven't you? I think the only reason people freeze is because they don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. I really think that. I yeah. Think it's like... But there, there will be times when people freeze and they do know what to do as well. Really? So Do you think... I, I mean, I, I, I've... Well, uh, well, in that scenario, it means they haven't drilled what you're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree. I'd agree. You know what I mean? I, but again, though, uh, as well, I think sometimes when they freeze, it's because maybe they know what to do, but they haven't... It's not necessarily about drilled. They just haven't got the stuff to do the thing, if that makes sense. I think that could be overcome with drilling, though. Possibly, yeah. I think. Oh. Dr drilling as one example of, of getting yourself ready to take action in a certain circumstance, right? Yeah, yeah. Especially I if it's complex action that you need to take, mm -hmm. you know, or a, a series of actions that need to get you out of it. As fucking hell, any, pretty much any contact or life-threatening situation in the military, like you were saying, you were... You were, um, what was your role? Search? Yeah. So high risk just, search? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. High yeah. risk search advisor or high risk search? No, no, no. So I did that when I was a sapper. So yeah. like, you know, it was, for, for any of the listeners that don't know the military, basically me, my team, I was in a team of six. Um, during the Herrick, um, Telic, as in Iraq and Afghanistan, <clears throat> the other way around, Afghanistan and Iraq, um, that, during that conflict, there was an, a need for specialised troops to be able to provide high assurance. Um, my team was like part of, of that um, asset, if you will. So most ground troops will have done that in some way, shape or form, but it was our exclusive job to do that. So if there was, say, a high threat scenario or a, an important op, or if something had been found, we'd then go and do it. Um, so yeah, I was I was just you know kind of like one of the as I always describe when I do any any talk of any description, I was one of the idiots that just walked around with a metal detector. Because when you think about it, you you can only describe that job as like idiocy in reality. You know when you look at it after, like obviously you're doing what you need to do, but when you actually you know I was 21 years old as well, and I think about some of the idiotic stuff that we did on that, and I say we, you know, like, well, yeah, we did, that you, if, if like you and I were having this conversation now, and then you were like, oh yeah, I heard about this, but you'd be like, this is ridiculous. Like, what? why Why would you do that? Like, you know, and again, I'm gonna have to go on now, I? Cause, you know, like for example, you'd, you'd get a double tone, which is telling you there's metal there. That, that'd be, you, you, you know, there could be like, hundred bods behind you waiting to go down this route. So, you know, you do your confirmation of trying to brush away the um, the sand and whatnot, or sorry, the dust, then, you know, you'd have to dig a little, dig a little bit with the bayonet. And then you wouldn't be able to, for whatever reason, find this piece of metal. Cause like in Afghanistan, there is a lot of rubbish, a lot of brass, you know, from, from firefights and whatnot, isn't there? Eventually your boss would be like, Danny, is this clear or not? And then you'd you'd stand on the area and go, yeah, it is. And then people would be like, why on earth would you do that? And you'd be like, well, I can't say that it's clear if I'm not with, you know, I wouldn't do it hastily when I wasn't sure, of course. I, you know, I'd have done enough investigation, but in order to prove it's okay, I'd have to stand on it. <laughs> you know, I'd, yeah, it's just lunacy, isn't it? As I say, idiots. idiots. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um it's like, it's so it's it's funny all the things if you walk into a recruiting center and the recruiting bod whoever you met and you're walking as a civvy and they actually told you all of the stuff that they don't wouldn't tell you normally all of the shit probably 99.9 percent .9 of someone's day-to-day -day career in the military is not enjoyable or neutral at best. Yeah. Whether you're on ops or whether you're back up, back in back in uh, back in the UK or wherever you're based, you know what I mean. It's uh, you would get you would not get a lot of people sign up. Your example is a perfect example. 
yeah, you're going to go away and go nuts. Right, fucking awesome. We're going to do that. What am I going to do? Right, you're going to have a metal detector. <laughs> it's going to be these hidden explosive things that kill people and you've got to find them. <laughs> yeah. It, and like, do you know what? We had a, like, we, we had a certain incident where, um, and this was, this was on Herrick 9. So, um, the end of 2008 going into 2009. And at that point, the ID threat was like ramping up through the roof. But the actual, um, assets to deal with that was very much not in place. So, for the whole of the Helmand um, area of operations, there was, I think there was, was either five or six permanent teams. You know, to give you a bit of context, we did over a hundred jobs, um, and that was like either known IDs or like it was we were going down a route that had some sort of intelligence to say, you know, there's ground sign or whatever, and uh, we. So we only had metal detectors and um, we had one incident where we, how can we say this, found an IED, aka we, you know, we were searching and, uh, well, I'll have to, I was searching an area and it was, it was on a, a road and basically the, the, the ID went off, or well, the mine went off behind us. And I was like... What, on an area you'd already cleared? Yes, ah. cleared. So it was like, I was like, shit, shit, shit. I am in so much trouble. You know, like, I was like, have I missed this? Oh my God, you know, am I going to get sent back to the UK? And um, long story short, what had actually happened was, um, there was two plastic mines on top of one another, an anti-personnel and an anti-tank. Um, and what had happened was they'd done, they'd fiddled around with this anti-personnel mine. Um, so it had less metal than it would have had anyway. Um, and then basically I'd obviously walked over it because that was my area. Um, I wasn't heavy enough to set it off. And then the jackal that was behind me, as in the vehicle, partialed. So basically it was the luckiest day all around, not, you know, not just for me as in, oh, I didn't, um, you know, get, get got, so to speak. If, even if everything would have happened the same, but the jackal would have got it, you know, I can only think of the hideous trauma I would have now as a result of that. So, uh, yeah, it was a, an incredibly lucky day all around, but that was, like I say, you know, we were just talking about metal detectors. And I remember at first the, the ammo tech officer coming over and saying, right, who searched that? And I was like, yeah, it was me, you know, waiting to get both barrels. And he's like, don't worry. It was a, pla it was plastic. So at first I was like, I'm God for that. You know, yeah, didn't, didn't mess up. And then me and my mate looked at each other and, you know, like simultaneously it was like, they got plastic mines, mm. you know? And then we had that realization of like, okay, so you've got these these metal detectors, but they're literally <laughs> null and void. <laughs> yeah. So it was, yeah, it, like, you know, it was a very, very strange time of, of my life without a doubt. Is there, a, is, is there any job or role in the military that you look on to? Look, you think, fuck, now I've got admiration for that, but I wouldn't do it. Um. Do you know what? I'd have to say something along the lines of, um, it, it's a difficult one, isn't it really? Because it all depends, like context super important when it comes to that, because like, you know, obviously for people like you and I of our generation, if you will, um, you know, when we reflect back on it now, we can look at some of the things we might have done at the time in good faith that were the right thing to do that now we'd go, man, I, I wish that, wish that hadn't happened. Um, so, you know, like if we were to be able to say it was like, I don't know, like a world war two type situation, you'd think, yeah, it'd be great to be like Apache helicopter part. Well, obviously they're on the way out now, aren't they? But you know what I mean? You go, that'd be an amazing job. Apache's on the way out. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw they're they getting decommissioned. Yeah. yeah. Like last week I saw someone really? on the news. I didn't know that. I don't, I don't even know whether it's, it's already happened, as in it's gone, but it was, yeah, last week they were, I've seen quite a bit about it. 
But like you say, you think, oh, that'd be a great job to have. But then when you look on it, it's like, wow, you, you've got a heavy burden to bear as well, potentially, depending on what, you know, there's a lot of situations where it might be difficult for an individual, isn't there? Depending yeah. on, and that's I, what I mean, I, context. I still do that job though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially since I, I found out, I was, I was a couple of years ago, those, those, those cockpits are aircon as well. Oh, <laughs> Lovely. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure Lovely. Yeah. Yeah, I, for me, it's like, I think um, it's high risk search stuff, for one. I think you fucking hell. Upmost operation for you know stuff you did. But no, thank you. Would I want to do that? And the other one is uh, loot teams, light electronic warfare teams. Like the guys who carry shit loads of comms kit in the back to intercept enemy communications on the ground. And I first experienced them directly in Afghan. And. Uh, and um, yeah, they just—I mean, they just patrolling about with with the the uh, the, the T arms with you know whatever the infantry unit is. Um, shitless comms, listening to the, at the time the Taliban constantly. Um, we love that, but they're carrying so much more weight than everyone else, and uh, and but just as much risk. But their job isn't to be combat; is to relay information, interpret information, speak a different language as well. So difficult. And and that when we went out in, on uh, on Herrick Four, they there was twenty of them in theatre and five of them were killed. Shit. Fucking that mental. Had us all lost. Twenty five percent of them. Yeah, fucking horrendous. Like a hideous job. And then one of the guys is out there, I saw him again on the the second time we went out. And exactly the same. He would carry a burgen of comms kit. How he would carry it, he was just one of these tall, wiry dudes. You think, how is your frame cutting about with that? Yeah. Because I'm in clip with my kit. Yeah. You know, and I'm just carrying bombs, bullets, and water. Mm. And you've got bombs, bullets, and water, and you got all that comms getting you back. But it's one of them, isn't it, where if you, like, when you think about adjusting to carrying that type of stuff, ECM, whatever, you know, you, you that's why people lose so much weight. You know, they, they, it's almost like if you were doing that job, you'd have to bulk up massively. So as long as you were, the engine room was all right, you'd want to be going out there heavy because if not, you would be emaciated when you got back. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, when did uh, when did In the Dead Ground start then? What's the genesis for that? So um, In the Dead Ground um, started, <laughs> cliche, cliche incoming, started um, during covid so during the first lockdown, basically a friend and I, at the time, um, he sadly had to step away from the business because of operational requirements and whatnot. I think we both naively went into it like, yeah, yeah, you know, like a lot of people think, like it, it is funny because the amount of people that will be like, oh yeah, give us some freebies or can I do that? And I'm just like, you have not no idea how, how complex and difficult running a clothing brand actually is people just think oh yeah everyone just you know you, you live the life of riley and whatever else um but yeah we started it together and basically he he wasn't able to continue due to his role and whatever else um so i then was like right i'll take the reins um so it's you know been going just short of four years now but what i would say is is I think originally when I started it, I started it in my, or we started it in mind as like a side hustle, if you will. You know, so it was like, oh yeah, we'll be able to run it alongside stuff. But then I'd say about two years ago, I was like, right, I actually think that I want to make this a proper business. And then that was when I started kind of adjusting the way I would work and like becoming more kind of, um, mindful of it being a business and you know like and I know that I can be quite loose as a person where I'll, I'm quite it's funny because a lot of people think oh yeah you, you're military done commando course done this done that I, but I'm like quite chill now you know I don't kind like don't get me wrong I've got my disciplines if you will you know fitness and whatever but like in terms of um the way I ran the business to begin with I'd be like do you know what I quite like the look of a basketball kit. I'm going to get one made, 
you know, and I'd have like zero budget. So I'd, I'd be spending money that I should have been buying stock with. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get this uh, sample of a basketball kit, you know, rinse a few hundred quid. And then I'd be like, you know, I'd look at the numbers and I'd be like, oh, there's no way I can actually make this. So then, I, you know, I'd say about two years ago was when I was like, right, you, you have to, like, don't get me wrong, you still have to look at new products and stuff, but I'm also more aware of what, yeah, like, the business aspect of it, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. So apart from it being side hustle, what was the other, what was the, what was the aim of it? So basically... Um, it's not just clothing brand. No, no, not at all. Um, you know, I always pitch it as merch of a message. Um the, the aim really is to try and make it a bit of a sort of go between, between somebody doing, you know, accredited training related to mental health and well being. And then obviously the, the social media stuff we'll see out in the world. Cause like, you know, there's a lot of, well, rubbish in, in general population to do with the topic of mental health and well being simply for the fact there's a lack of insight. So when I say a go-between, I, I'm quite aware I'm not naive or, you know, too sort of verbose about it to think, yeah, someone buys a T-shirt off me, they don't need to do training on the topic. Not at all. But like with what I do in terms of content I put out, I try and steer the conversation to a different, you know, a different aim. Like I think the big communication around mental health and poor mental health, etc., has for a long time been just talk to someone, just talk to someone, just talk to someone, which of course that is a message we want to get people to kind of pick up and run with. But at the same time, that doesn't take into account the, like if you look at our generation, for instance, um, you know, we're, we, we kind of like straddle two worlds don't we where you know like i feel like the our parents can they don't look at us as being soft so to speak you know in inverted commas whereas they might look at their grandchildren uh in a slightly different way. and again i'm generalizing massively here so i think i think our generation kind of can can go between but i'm quite aware things like you know when people talk about crying as a man now I'm more than happy to admit, I can't cry to save my life. I'd love to. The only t- do you know the only time I cry? When I watch Band of Brothers. <laughs> it's the only time I cry. I'll, I'll sit there and I'll just be like, those guys. And like, I honestly, I, I cry every time, you know. But other than that, I don't. And it's, it's not for not being uh, in touch with <clears throat> my feelings, not from being, you know, having a poor level of emotional literacy. It's just, I I just haven't developed that skill yet. And I'm sure I might over time. Um, but circling back to it. Skill. The, s- skill. I will, again, I think it can be, it could be a skill. I think it's just a trait, isn't it? Some people do it, some people don't. Uh, it's it's an interesting one because I think, again, skill's probably not the right word. And you were right to challenge me on it, if you will. But I think it's it's not something that I've done it's not something I've grown up with doing. And again, it's not that I think it, there's anything wrong with it. I just don't do it. Um, whereas I think there is this, like like you say, if we're talking about skills, emotional literacy, literacy and being able to talk about what it is that is going on for us, I feel is something that we need to promote more. You know, we need to promote that we don't want to just be angry or agitated. Or if we are agitated, why are we agitated? Talk about that. Um, but yeah, going back to it, the, the brand. So like I try and put a lot of focus on rather than it just being, you know, um, go and talk to somebody. I, I try and spin it the other way and say, well, look, if you've noticed something, you go and talk to them. That's a barrier that, cause I think a lot of people think for argument's sake, you need to be an expert to go and speak to somebody who might be experiencing poor mental health. The example that I like to give is, for instance, what we were talking about before, Obama. You know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, troops would get given a week 
maybe two <clears throat> weeks maximum training on Op Armor, which is how to secure vulnerable po- or how to try and find IEDs around vulnerable points. They weren't experts, but if if they hadn't done that, I, I think about the amount of lives lost or w- that would have been lost had that not happened. Now, again, I know it's not an, a direct comparison by any means, but I do feel like, you know, if you can just be compassionate and understanding, you, you can talk to people about this topic without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think the only problem is at the minute with the mental mental health and mental health first aid, and, and which obviously you're very knowledgeable on, um, is there's a danger that people who are learning about how to how to monitor and address, mon- yeah, how to monitor and deal with varying levels of mental ill health for themselves. I think there's a danger that their first port of call is external. So instead of the first, their first, their first uh, action being, okay, how can I self help? Mm-hmm. Let's explore the self help options first. Instead of doing that, because quite often you can you can make things a lot more comfortable, or even resolve the issue completely through self help steps, like we can do with physical physical health. The same thing, right? Rest, alternative exercises, um, uh, you know, rehabilitation, um, as in self self administered, if you want to call it that. We can do the same with mental health. I think there's a danger that people be people these days their default will be go to external help straight away. How do you mean external help, just so I can understand, like, exactly? I feel sad. I'm yeah. going to go and talk to someone. I need therapy. Okay. I mean... <sighs> I, I feel sad. I can't fix it myself. There's need, it, it, That doesn't even, even jump into my mind. So what I think is, okay, I feel sad. Obviously, I'm not, I don't feel sad. I feel things that I... You, yeah. if you feel sad, that's okay, <laughs> I. But, you know, when I, when I feel... When I feel that there is uh, something negative about my mental health I could be fucking having a bad day I could feel sad one day I could feel depressed one feel depressed one day I could feel really anxious one day none of these things more than normal and and for no particular reason I can pinpoint then my first thing is okay self help well the first part of that is okay let's try and work out why is there a reason I'm super anxious this morning is there a reason I am struggling out of bed at the minute is there a reason I've got no energy in the gym at the minute? Okay, go through it. If I can find the reason, I try and address it myself. It could be work stress. It could be uh, uh, personal emotional stress. It could be I could have a physical illness. I could have an illness I don't know about. It could be if I don't if, if I know what it is and I try and address it myself and try and resolve it myself. Most of the things I think you can. If I don't know what the answer is and the symptoms persist, that's when I'll go look in external. Have I done what I can to fix it myself? No. Or do I know what I can do to fix it myself? No. External. I suppose the challenge is, though, with that versus the general population is obviously, you know, you're a highly trained form soldier. You've had years of military training where, um, you know, it's kind of like you've got a lot of skills already. But I suppose the the challenges is where do we draw the line of like when is the good time to go and do it? Because there'll be a lot of people that wouldn't have the same level of skill at you that you would of knowing your own body, knowing what is things that might cause, you know, like you say, is it stress at work? Is it, you know, I'm drinking too much coffee or, or whatever it might be. Um, I suppose that the big challenge for us is to kind of, we, it's it's impossible for us to draw a line. Um, and like, you know, I also feel like when it comes to stuff like therapy, I think actually there's, there's a lot of people, like, do you know what, I, I saw someone once and I thought it was really good. A lot of people who go to therapy is because somebody they don't know, oh, sorry, somebody they do know won't go to therapy. And I think that that's a really, a really <laughs> important, like, you know, it, it's, it's fine and well for us to say, you know, and, and I agree, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of self-efficacy and whatever else. And that's kind of like something that I'd always talk about. But again, I'm quite aware, you know, 
when I was 16, I worked in the gym. So from, you know, when I was six or sorry, 15, even I've, I've been learning about the body and, and health and wellbeing and whatever else, you know, got all the experiences of the military and whatever else, but a lot of people don't have that. Um, so it's kind of like, I think, and, and the other thing I would address as well is there's probably for everybody you're mentioning there that is, um, you know, going to seek things before they actually need it. There's people that leave it far too long and then they end up in crisis. So again, the, we, if we think about like British people in general, stiff upper lip, you know, I don't want any more attention than I, I feel like I need at any given time. I reckon in this country, you know, that we'd probably be more likely to have more people in that predicament than the other way around. But that's the question of emotional awareness, leaving it far too long. That's the question of not knowing about that self-help scenario, right? Because the first part of self-help scenario is self-monitoring, self-awareness. But if we look at like our peers, you know, like obviously, you know, you, your former parachute regiment soldier, you know, the phrase reg it out, like, you know, it's it, it's the same sort of like, you know, if, if I was to say like the equivalent, my peers would say it'd probably be like, oh, you know, squadron or what, like get, get, get a grip yourself, so to speak. The problem is, you know, or grizz it out, all these types of things that actually they've got a place, of course they do, but would our peers be more likely to just be like, do you know what? I'm regging it out. I'm grizzing it out. I'm doing whatever. So again, it, even our peers who might still have a good level of awareness, they're going to fall victim to this because of that. Do you know what? I'm going to grind it out mindset, so to speak. Uh, Potentially. Again, I, yeah, maybe. I, yeah. I, I tried to register out and it did not work out well. But, but I learned about the self-help stuff because of that experience and 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 this is but this is the thing isn't it is like <laughs> this is the like the dichotomy of it because it's kind of like you had to do you know you did do the regin out and then you did end up um you know again i don't know the background of that um but you know you did then have to deal with that if you know what i mean and mm. i think that's where our you know i mean a phrase i i love to to say to people um Again, because what I always try and focus on with this topic is those that do need. Um, and the reason why I always try and focus on that is because I do genuinely believe there will be more people that do need to access this than than don't. You mean mental health support? Support, yes. As in those who are, are um, in need but not receiving it. Because, as I say, I, I genuinely believe... There's, there's more, you know, if we think about the, again, I, something I always talk about when it comes to this topic is um, the barriers that we put in place when we say things. So um, not so long ago, I, I've been, we've been having our house renovated and I had some carpet fitters in, and this isn't, this is an example I use when I give training as well. Um, someone said to me, um, you know, like just in conversation, three lads, um, what do you do? it was like a Tuesday and I was just in the house and whatever else. So I explained, you know, like a bit about the brand. And then I also talked about, yeah, and I deliver mental health first aid training to corporate businesses. And the first thing the lad said was, he goes, oh yeah, loads of people fake it. Um, fake what? As in having poor mental health. They, they <laughs> fake it. That was the first. He goes, oh, that's the big problem. Loads of people fake it. And I was I like- I met a military guy said to me once. And he was running. He was going to write. Sorry, to, sorry, interject. Because I yeah, yeah, it's fine. I don't get often. I often, don't often get a chance to mention this. This dude. I'm not going to mention my name. He pro, I, but anyway, he said he was writing a book. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I laugh at it. It's so ridiculous. He said to me, "I'll write a book" because I'd, I'd written a book at the time. So I'm writing a book, and uh, I said, "Oh yeah, cool. What's it about?" And uh, he said, um, "PTSD." I said, "Oh yeah." I said, "Fucking mega." Yeah. I said, "Yeah." He said, "Yeah." I'm going to write about. It. It's all fucking bollocks. It's just people. People are just fucking weak, and they are, I, I and I, I, we were washing in the ablutions. Right, we, I wasn't serving at the time, but we were in a in a camp somewhere, and uh, I stopped. I thought he was joking, mm. and he wasn't joking. He was deadly serious. Going to write a book about PTSD. Now it's all bollocks, and it's just people that can't can't um, can't grip it or something like that. Mental. These people walk among us, and he was military. Mm. 
Anyway, sorry to sorry. No, no, no. It's the book a, never got written to my knowledge. <laughs> it's it's uh, in his in his Google Docs somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and yeah, all all I was saying is is like things that that when we talk about this topic, the barriers that can get put in place so easily and even accidentally. So that that lad, um, I said, do you know what, mate? I'm not going to argue with you because I guarantee you there will be people out there who use. Um, mental ill health as a platform for them to get time off work when it is not needed. I said, however, the issue is, let's think about when you say that, the impact that could have. So I was like, right, you three work together every day, do you? And they were like, yeah, yeah, every day. And I said, if one of these boys here was having a difficult time, would you want him to talk to you? And he was like, yeah, absolutely, of course I would. And I said, okay. So when the topic of poor mental health has come up and the very first, very, very, very first thing that you've said is yeah, loads of people fake it. Does that not create an atmosphere of, if you talk to me about poor mental health, I'm gonna judge you and I might judge you to be either faking it or it's not sufficient enough to, to warrant you having poor mental health or whatever else. And he was like, shit, I never thought about it like that. And that's what, like, that, those types of reasons why I always focus on those that do. Because I can't help it. You know, like, say when, when we were in the military, somebody had shin splints, and it'd be like, okay, they, they don't want to go for a run. You know, that's kind of like, and I, but again, I've actually had shin splints, so I'm like, yeah, you can have shin splints and not just be bluffing it. And... um it's one of those things where, like, that that's the same thing for me. It's like, look, let's focus, you know, um, Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. Well, the end is, let's look at the people who do need the extra support. They do need professional um, interaction. And I'm, I'm not going to worry about the others, if that makes sense, because I, I can't, I can't control anything related to that. Whereas I can, I, not control, but I can try and influence the outcomes of those that do need it. Mm. So, how would you tie that into in the dead ground? Then? So, I think like the the biggest things is, first of all, is creating messaging <clears throat> that obviously repeated messaging about trying to change the conversation you know we i use the military because the like, like that obama thing i just mentioned but there's so many comparisons that we can look at and say oh that is similar to that and i'm sure you know that's how a lot of people make a living um you know who've left the military and they've got some experiences and wrote books and whatever else um so yeah, what what I try and do is obviously the messaging part. I I put that out there, and that's kind of like what I would call a library, uh, not what I would call how I refer to it as like a library, because then people can go on our reels and have a look. And generally, a lot of the stuff that they've um, that you know, say if someone because this happens to me quite a lot. To be fair, um, a I spot things quite quickly often because because of the work I do, I'll think, oh, so-and-so seems a bit different at the minute. I'm going to have a chat with them. Um, But on the other hand, because I talk about the topic, because I'm happy to discuss, you know, I've had poor mental health in the past. I have poor mental health to this day in various ways, shapes or forms, which I'll be happy to talk about. Um, People will then come to me and be like, hey, Dan, got this thing I want to talk to you about. So, you know, but most of the time when people have this thing, I'll have done a post that that's relative to it. So I try and have that out there. Second line is um, the when people make orders, um, I've got some cards, out, I've got some with me. Um, that basically I try and relate pieces as in clothing pieces to either messages or tangible things that isn't just support people with mental health because obviously that's empty and we've all got mental health anyway, which it doesn't make sense. Um, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, um, so, and I'll give like practical things that people can do. Like one of the, the 
the collections, if you will, messages, however you want to put it, uh, is baseline. And all it is is I've come up with an acronym of baseline, and it's um, top tips, so to speak, for somebody who, um, if if you think they might be having a difficult time, things that might help your conversation with them. It's not a drill like you know we'd have um, experienced in the military. But it's something that someone can look at. You know, my peer group now is like senior NCO warrant officer. And I know loads of them that say, oh, I keep that card in my desk. And if I'm going to have a chat with one of my people, I can have a look at it and try and think, okay, you know, before they uh, like prepping themselves for the conversation. Um, And then I think the final thing is kind of like it related to the clothing itself. So a lot of the clothing is designed around fizz kit. You know, like, I don't want to labour the point about fizz too much, purely because a lot of people talk about it already. But the way I look at it is if somebody, if if I can create clothing that helps make someone want to get active, that's achieving the aim already. Like, I don't want to worry about whether they're, you know, climbing Snowden, Obviously not in shorts and trainers in the snow. Um, but, you know, I don't want to worry about whether they're doing that or whether they're doing CrossFit or whether they're doing BJJ. I just like an opportunity for people to be able to, or sorry, I'd like to think I can help in some way, shape or form somebody's journey to just doing physical activity. But then the other thing is, I, you know, we do some wackier stuff, you know, like your Hawaiian shirts and stuff like that. And again, you'd say, well, how are they related? Well, the answer is they're not. But again, second aim is get people talking. So someone sees me wearing a Hawaiian shirt and goes, that's a bit loud. Or I mean, people don't say that to me anymore because I wear Hawaiian shirts all the time. Um, In the summer anyway, I haven't got one on now, have I? But if somebody's at a barbecue and then someone goes, wow, that's a bit bright, whatever conversation starter isn't it oh it's by this brand it's about mental health da, 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 da. have a look at this this is some of the the resources they've got etc etc so again it's it, i'm subtly opening a conversation or you're not me but the brand is then subtly opening up a conversation mm. on a on a, a normal way like the, the the first line of baseline is be normal because too many i you know too many people like put things on more of a pedestal than they need to be because they think they need to fix it. But it's like, you know, you're you're not a counselor or a therapist, so don't put that pressure on yourself. It's just, you want to open up and how are you doing? What you've been up to, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then you can start thinking about, listen, I've noticed these things are a bit different. Is everything okay? Et cetera. Go from there. Yeah, it's so much easier. It's so much easier to get someone uh, to for someone to, uh, to to cultivate an environment where people feel okay that they can bring up their their feelings. Yeah. Um, if they the the person or the organisation they bring it up to has demonstrated that they will talk about their own feelings anyway. Yeah. When yeah. I um, the company I'm at now, um, I've been here for a few years now. But my first or second year there, I started doing. Organized because I want I wanted to do it and hold myself accountable to, to I needed to is one of the measures I was taking to try and sort my head out and it was meditation and I would go at, at lunchtime a couple of days a week and say hey I'm going to go and do some meditation who wants to join me and it, it basically make myself do it yeah it was because if other people are going oh yeah I'll come and I had to go and do it I couldn't jack on myself and I go and do that can I ask you a question quickly yeah, question. um your peers are they um, military, ex-military? Because again, I, I, I think that that's such a powerful thing. Because obviously, people know your background, and again, you're like demonstrating. Because we forget these things, you know, that people who haven't served will look at us and be like, "Wow, if Hugh's doing that and he's done this, this, and this, then maybe it's some something I should look into." And it's it's not, you know. Again, I'm not saying meditation's um, feminine or whatever. And again, masculine versus feminine and all that's out the window nowadays anyway. But it might get somebody who wouldn't normally engage with that to engage with that. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, 
Where was I? Oh yeah, so we go. I go and do that. I like, go in. I'm no. I'm no meditation instructor guru, or whatever. But I, I had an app, and I would connect the. I would use and I connect the app to the speakers in this like activity room they had, and I do the meditation with everyone else. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes is all it was. But at the end of it, I would say I'd switch it off and say, "Cool, thanks, come in." I've and I'd say I deliberately say it. I really needed that. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. not been great last couple mm. of days. I've been super stressed. Maybe I had, and maybe I hadn't. But I was just saying it so that other people would like. It's a it's a common thing. Oh, he's he's <clears throat> he's feeling that. I am too. It made them think about what they feel themselves. And what would happen is each time we would leave, I'd end up going back up to the floor I worked. And every time it happened, it'd be a different person would say, would sidle up alongside me and they'd start talking about how they were feeling. Yeah, I've been really having a tough time too. And, and I was like, fucking hell. And it sort of demonstrated to me the power of so advocacy. It's EDIP, isn't it? Explanation, demonstration, imitate. And then you're just fucking doing it. Well, it, you know, with stuff like that as well, like, again, we can boil that down to, like, vulnerability is strength, can't we? You know, you think if somebody's going to, if, you, if you're if you in a situation where you were, I don't know, aiming to close with and, and destroy the enemy, well, guess what? The leader, more times than not, will go first, won't they? They'll demonstrate their body, you know, they'll... Sh- put their body on the line and be like, look, you can do this too. And then others will follow, you know, and it, it's the same, again, not the exact same, obviously, but it's, it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? Look, I can do this. You can do this too. It's this, you know, that's the way I always look at it. You've created, you've given permission to be vulnerable rather than just, oh, sorry, you've shown it's okay to be vulnerable rather than just saying, you can come and talk to me anytime. Yeah, it, 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 for blokes, anyway, it does sound. You mentioned femininity earlier. It does sound. I mean, I think I think in this conversation we can slight, like, slightly genderize because obviously there is, you know. And again, so I don't want to cut you off there. By the way, um, I think this is another thing that we need to change the conversation on: is men don't talk. Like you know, well, that messaging is wrong. Exactly. The mental health message you're directly towards men is just fucking crap. And, and, from wherever and, it comes from, it's terrible. Uh, so for me, men might be less likely to talk, but they still can. Because there's loads of people that do. You you know, you talk about it, I talk about it. So that's 100% of the people in this room right now. <laughs> <You know laughs> I mean? um, yeah, sorry, go on, I interrupted you. No, 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 it's all right. I can't remember, I can't remember what we're saying. Oh, the, um, the, the femininity on the... On the subject of yeah. you know, men talking, yeah, yeah. I, like your point, yeah, we do talk. What men, what men don't commonly do is talk openly about their feelings to other men. Guaranteed, men do it to women in certain circumstances, but not so much to to other men. Go on. So I'd actually challenge that slightly, but I think the way men do it is, I call it like again, this is uh, I'm no neurologist or psychiatrist, by the way, but this is what I've nicknamed it. I nickname it a micro disclosure. You know, the conversation goes like this. I say, how's it going, Hugh? And you go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm all right. Um, I've been a bit stressed about X, Y, or Z, but, you know, that it is what it is. And then I go, yeah, it's shit, in it? And then we move on. But you've told me, you've physically told me. So rather than going, okay, let's talk, let's talk that's all. In my eyes, all that's required. Oh, okay. Do you want to talk about it? Should, like, tell me more about that. I think men do do it. It's just the way we interact is often like a, yeah. Yeah, I think that even just saying you're stressed is a step further than what most people say. It's not even that. Yeah, it, it wouldn't even be an indication of the feelings that they work shit at the minute. Yeah. Okay, why? Explain why. That's as far the conversation goes. Now, the point I was going to make about um, it being like talking about your feelings is... is, is uh, Potentially viewed as feminine, or is pursued, is pursued is perceived, perceived for God's sake, <laughs> perceived as weak, sub, subconsciously perceived as, as a as a weak thing to do because you're vocalising what is perceived to be a weakness about you, right, which is what which is basically what it's all about. Is um, is is that is incorrect? You can you can. I've got a group of, of uh, got a certain circle of my friends, and we, we most of us ex-military, all different units, different got to different levels in the military, and now in civil street we're at different levels, from CEOs, MDs down to people like me who work for a line manager, work for a boss, right? 
But when we meet up with each other or when we have a conversation or whether that's text, voice message, whatever, or it's in person and some and one of us says to the other, how's it going, mate? We instinctively respond honestly. Mm. Because in that circle, we know we're all on board in the same in the same mindset. We're all really emotionally aware. We all have had similar or hard experiences mentally in the in the past that we've come through or are still coming coming through. And so, in we we you know, like how you instinctively interact with another person from your old unit compared to a civvy friend. You instinctively you, you different mannerisms, it's different word and it's different sentences, and you you got, compared to a civvy, right? You've got prior understanding yeah, yeah, knowledge yeah. haven't you it's the same thing with this group so if a friend of mine was to ask one of these guys was to say How, how's it going you I literally think how in my head I think how is it going if I'm fucking stressed if I'm miserable or if something I will say that right? it's crap at the minute why I said I'm really struggling at the moment and it'll be a why but the point is I'm being honest in that response most blokes I think when you're asked how's it going you have a instinctive response just default yeah sound mate yeah going sound I was working yeah fine I think yeah, again the, the one, I bullshitted for years on it bullshitted for years on it I think the thing again that I think you can bullshit some people we can't bullshit others like I think that you know that if you know what you are looking for and when I say this I'm talking either changes in their behaviour that you know or you have a rough idea about signs or symptoms to do with poor mental health, what have you. People will go, but are you? Mm. The right people will. Yeah, yeah. That, but I'm not. But again, this is where the <clears throat> this is the the journey, isn't it? This is the direction that I think, like what I was saying before, where men are, where things are changing, if you will, where maybe you know the Gen Z. Um, youth if you will where they might be better than us in at this if you know what i mean because obviously the movement has progressed so much since you know like i i remember i didn't have a clue that i'd had any sort of poor mental health until i did a mental health first aid course and i literally sat there going i've had that i get that every day <laughs> at all time is that not normal and you know, so like now, I think from people doing this type of trick, like, this, you know, the, the other day, um, th there's over a million people been trained by Mental Health First Aid England now. That's over a long period of time, but that's still a million people whose literacy on the topic mm. has been, you know, heavily improved. Like people do criticize Mental Health First Aid, but I think that the people that do criticize it, A, have probably never been through it, and B, they don't understand it. They they anticipate that it's going to be like, you know, that you that you should be the same as a psychologist by the end of it. But you know, you're like, well, if you did a physical first aid course, you you wouldn't be like, don't worry, I've got this heart attack, guys, no no bother. But for some reason, people kind of align the two, and you're like, well, that that's not going to happen. That's not the aim. Um, yeah, I, as I say, I, I do believe that. Like, I, I agree with what you're saying, that people do mask and, and you know, 100% they do. But I feel like we can, you can notice, especially even even if it's just, the, you don't know that it's a sign, so to speak. You just know there's something different going on about mm. it, with them. Something different, that's all, you know. And again, like, this is where we get into, like, the minutiae of um, sort of, like diagnosing people and so you don't need to you just need to go like like you just said there yeah thing things are a bit shit at the minute actually okay do you want to talk about it let's you know i had a guy you know i won't mention any names um a while ago who he'd said something on social media like um um if you need me just text me i'm coming off social media for a bit <clears throat> so i sent him a text and i said i need you and he was like Oh, what's up, mate? And I said, I need you to tell me why you're going off social media. And then there and then he said, oh, well, I've been experiencing this. I'm, I'm having these intrusive thoughts. Blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, cool, let, let's deal with it. And that was just literally because he'd said, I'm leaving social media. Now, some people might leave social media for, for reasons other than that. And, I'm, you know, again, I don't want to portray myself as thinking I'm some kind of frigging guru, by the way. It's just, I think... 
if it's it's like you know when when you're in the military and you pull someone for like they're not meeting the standard whatever standard it might be you know if you can kind of I'm not going to say pull someone but you know if someone says something you go no we need to talk about this actually I think that tells them right they're comfortable having this conversation like people I, I genuinely believe a lot of people want to talk about what they're experiencing it's just like you say the the key word you said before was environment and I think a lot of the time that's what that's what we need to develop is curating an environment like you know again if we use your example of your group of friends you know you've all got that prior knowledge and whatnot I feel the same way at um, jiu-jitsu so you know I, I've been training jiu-jitsu about 18 months. I'm absolutely rubbish, by the way, just to get that out there. It's not the easiest of sports, mate. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's it's one of them things. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I, th- I think I apply a lot of the same principle of just try and use strength and see if it works. <laughs> and it doesn't. Um, but, like, the guys that go there, honestly, the community um, is, is fantastic. And, you know, the guys uh, at Trident Martial Arts <clears throat> on the world, that is, they've done an amazing job. Um, but again, I think the the thing is with it, if you look at activities like that, stuff like jujitsu, cold water therapy, you know, I think they're the types of activities where you plug in to the activity so much that it's so good for your well mental state because you, you just, you, you don't worry about anything else. You know, you're just literally focused on the here and now. And I think that that's something that not enough of us do do. And the barriers that, like social media, we talked about social media before. I think one of the problems with, with it, it sounds a bit odd actually, but one of the problems with the health and fitness industry is people using mental ill health as a marketing technique, i.e. saying this will help your mental health. Even though it's factually correct, I think the problem you create then is people doing these activities with the sole aim of their mental health getting better rather than to do the activity. I'll give you an example. When I've felt like the worst I've ever felt, I'd go and do this and I'd be like this, like, right, I've been training about 20 minutes now. Why is my brain not feeling any better? And I'd be like, and I'm not saying every, I'm just purely anecdotally talking about myself. Whereas if I just go to the gym, you know, train, and then I'm finished, I, I, you do feel better? I yeah. went off on a bit of a tangent there, sorry. No, 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 I, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, the, yeah, you could, there, there, is, there is a different way you could market the, I mean, the physical aspect. It's, it, but that, the problem is it is factually true. It's the way it's marketed, like this will, look, we talked, in the coffee shop before, didn't we? Saying this will help. You're that, you know. You're then like, okay, this has, this will help. Whereas if it, this can help. It's a, you know, slightly different way of mm. positioning it. But like you say, then people will start doing more things outside of that. Whereas you might get someone who's just like, oh, I'm doing this. Why am I not feeling any better? But it also negates the people who do do all the right things but still have poor mental health thing is as well it's different types of fitness as well you know um what's, you, what's your go-to now boxing yeah so jiu-jitsu jiu-jitsu example boxing example yeah i like playing rugby yeah although i'm constantly injured so i think I'm, i think i've been it again um we're always injured though that's my that's my mantra what so I have a like when my you say you're always injured. My mantra is I am always injured. Right. So what I mean by that is <laughs> is like I'll give you so my shoulder's been niggling me for months. This is, you have to sell this well, this mantra yeah, well yeah, to yeah. me because <laughs> tr- tr- just follow this, right. So my shoulder's been niggled for months and then last week or the week before I was I was rolling with this guy and basically I won't go into the full details of it but he swept me and my foot was like underneath and then my big toe got caught oh no and it didn't it didn't fully dislocate but it's heavily heavily sprained shoulders not hurting at the minute but my toe is so i just tell myself right you you are always going to have pain in some you know i've had hip surgery 
I'm always going to have pain in some joint, so I'm always injured. So I'll accept that. Yeah. It's the it's the motion it just, inhibiting injuries it, of doctor. It, it just oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on the on those you know those physical activities, if they, be, I think you know, jujitsu perfect example. You, you if in order to do that training again, whether you're drilling or whether you're sparring, you your brain has to be on it 100. Mm. percent And it's and you don't have the choice Same of boxing. half concentrate and rugby. You, you, yeah, it, yeah, exactly, exactly my point. So you're on it 100. percent your brain, I, I think, is in a form of meditation. Or you mm-hmm. yeah, meditation, yeah. are you in the zone? Are you just full focus on something? And you have to be whether you like it or not, at least for certain parts of that training. On a rugby pitch, you could be stood there waiting for the ball. Yeah. Right? But as soon as you start moving and you start running, you're focused on where the ball is, whether you've got the ball in your hand or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jiu-jitsu. Like w- wingers, you know, they spend a long time on the side. Yeah, exactly. They waiting wingers. for their time. Jiu-jitsu is the same thing, right? You're drilling, you're watching the, you're watching the coach give a, give a demonstration of a, or the, what do you call him? The uh, professor. Giving a, giving a demonstration of a movement. Oh, at that point, I've got one of them little monkeys in my head who's doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then yeah. I'll, I'll be like, that to my partner. Mate, exactly. what did he say? What did he say? And then you go to drill it, and then yeah. your brain has to be on it when you're drilling it, even if you're being the gimp for your partner to drill the move. And then you go to spar on another level. It's the same with boxing. You know, you can be on the bag as a certain a certain amount of focus needed for that then you could be sparring or you could be going full out you're, you're fully on it your brain the point I'm making is it's not about you thinking about the thing you're doing it's that everything else is fucking switched off mm, that's it your work's not on your brain your relationship's not on your brain your injuries aren't on your brain unless you're at that moment in time everything is switched off now the problem these one of the problems these days I think is, oh that was a big was a, yeah, yeah. one of the problems these days I think is that um People don't give it the brain time to switch off. And that is, I've said it a million times before on this podcast, being at the bus stop. We used to sit at the bus stop, if you use a bus, or at the train station. You used to sit there waiting for the train, or stand there waiting for the train or the bus, or waiting for the taxi or the Uber. In that time previously, for our generation, your brain wouldn't be, you, 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 you'd be in your head thinking things through, processing things, just fucking randomly thinking about random shit. You wouldn't be occupied by an external thing like your phone for example it's the same in the gym when I go in the gym as in the weights gym and you see people in there most people in there no a lot of people in there are on their phones in between yeah. sets go, what are you doing you won't, you're getting it's, um, about a 25% benefit from this gym you're getting the physical benefit you're not getting the mental benefit of sit on that bench after you've done your bench press set and for that minute before, or 30 seconds whatever that break you're taking is between be in your own head just be thinking don't be doing anything don't be looking at fucking Instagram or whatever. Leave the, leave the phone in the locker. But with the generation below us, they've never experienced yeah, that benefit. Yeah, yeah. They've never had it. Mm. They don't realise what's there to be gained. Yeah, yeah. You know, my, my, my kids, when they start getting old enough to go to the gym, they come with me, be like, no, no phones allowed in the gym. And to them, it's not normal to bring your phone in the gym. Even though everyone else is in there, they feel bad bringing it in. Although I'm suspicious of my eldest. I think she brings it in when I'm not there. Mm. But, you know, and, and maybe they realise the benefit or not to that, but there's definitely a benefit not bringing it in. I think, and, that, and that's where community things really help as well, like your CrossFits where they're doing a class and, you you know, you it's the, the phone's not there, is it? It's just you do, obviously, unless people are filming and whatever else. What I was going to say is, do you don't need to bring back them little... Remember them little MP3 players? iPod Nano. Well, even before, like, I remember, so when I joined, I joined the army in uh, 2005, I remember when I was doing all my training to, to join, I had this little, it was like, it was basically like a USB pen, and it was, you know, it was something ridiculous, like I could have 30 songs on it at any given time. And, but that, that was perfect. You know, it had, it, it had basically one playlist on, and then that would just, Put that on, and then that was me, you know, going out for a run, doing whatever. Because, um, like, that, the problem you have in the gyms is, let's face it, if you go into a commercial gym, the playlists are usually crap, aren't they? So, you, you like, most people... music. It's yeah. Music. Most people want their own music. So, where do most people store their music? On their phone. Why do you need music? What, do you just... Do you just nothing, reg it out? No, reg, I no, don't have no music. I in the gym and have nothing. Strong. Nothing whatsoever. And the gym I go to has no music on the speakers. I think I'm going to... The one in to... work has got music on. I went in... <laughs> I went in the, the, the one in work yesterday morning. And yeah. Blasting. I mean, obscenely loud in there. Was Ricky Martin living La Vida Loca. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. It wasn't, it wasn't helpful. 
But anyway, I go in with no music. And yeah. I actually, I, I went through a phase, it was at the beginning of COVID, probably when you were starting up, starting up your business. And I started running again, um, seriously. And I go, you know, five, 10, 15 miles, depending on what I was doing. And I, I would listen to music when I was doing it. And I stopped listening to music while I was doing it. So I deliberately to go, all right, to get your fucking head out of that, just, just sort of give yourself some headspace. I would solve problem like work problems, yeah. podcast thoughts and stuff like that, where you okay, decision things and life problems. I would come up with the best ideas, the best thoughts and the best solutions on those runs. Because mm. your brain is basically working, okay, okay, we just run the legs just gotta go left and right and the arms left and right for this. What else are we gonna think about? What can we fix? <laughs> yeah, but and you know what, that's really interesting because then uh, if you think about it, you're, you're plugged into the activity, but you're also just plugged into surroundings. And what, so yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm gonna have to uh, go into my commercial gym with um, ear defenders on or something like that. Yeah. Just try and try, try and <laughs> try and block the noise out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that the, these days, I think even our generation now, and maybe a small proportion of the generation above us who have. Who have had, who've sort of succumbed to the same influence of the smartphone mm -hmm. is that we most of us are uncomfortable in our own thoughts. We we default to well, partly it's physical habit. We default to when when there's nothing to do, waiting at the bus stop, for example, waiting for a train or waiting for whatever, or sitting on the couch. We default to get the device out, look at it, scroll through. Okay, finish that app scrolling, go to the next app, look at that next app, look at that. Yeah, and, I, and I, I'm terrible that, for it, personally. Yeah, when you don't I, have I that, know, you become uncomfortable in your, own, in, your own, in your own thoughts, which is bad. Yeah. Because then it means that the only time your brain gets to process information is when you sleep it. Mm. And that's good, but it used to be much more. And technology and its impact on us has evolved much faster than the brain has being able to evolve to cope with it. Well, that's why, um, like with the brand, that's why the logo is a saber tooth tiger. Because, you know, I've, books I've read relating to the brain and different levels of neurology and what, like I'm, again, I'm no expert in comparison to others and other guests you would have. I, I'm interested in it, but I'm, I'm not an expert. But, you know, a lot of what our base function of our brain is, is safety danger whatever else um so the saber tooth tiger the reason behind that is it's kind of like a little nod to that like what you've just said is like look a lot of these responses that we have developed when these things were an issue for us whereas they're not you know those responses that we have are for you know those those things that we get anxious about now like our our brain can't tell whether it's, oh, I'm anxious because my post hasn't got enough likes or it's, oh, there's a saber tooth tiger around the corner trying to get me. You know, it's our, our brain has a lot of difficulty kind of um, filtering out between the two. Is this because it's not give, being given the opportunity? Yeah, exactly. It's definitely one of the reasons, I think, uh, uh, one of the reasons that anxiety, like people with anxiety is through the roof so over the last 10, 15 years, especially uh, among women and young women is because the brain isn't being given the opportunity to think through process the emotional feelings and uh and I don't want to, not triggers but stimuli they have throughout the day you know um and so you you have this anxiety which you would maybe have anyway but in the past it would have, you would be able to address it straight away because your brain would have the opportunity to think okay what about a situation Jen went through what he or she said to me what I think, what I did, uh, this problem I think I created or that I'm part of. How do I, what does that mean? What can I do to change that? We don't have that opportunity because we're taking it away from ourselves by constantly being immersed in what there is on social fucking media, mainly. Yeah, it's it's, it's dopamine, just isn't it? Like hits and hits. Yeah, but it's, and... it's bluff. Mm. It's bluff dopamine. Oh, it's yeah, like but... dopamine, but you're not getting any benefit from what you Yeah, doing. yeah, that, but that's what I'm saying is like, we, we've kind of, like again, this is not someone I'm an expert on, but like the 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 way because I don't know you watch a dog video or something and you go oh that's nice huh and then your you, your body you wouldn't have had that many responses in a day where you'd be like oh that's funny 
we wouldn't have done that in the past, would we? So, like you say, your body's like, I want some more of that. Let's let, let let's have let let's try and get a bit bit extra. It, it's that kind of thing, isn't it? Where we've we've created this this new need, not new need, but a an addiction, if you will, that wasn't there before because our body just was not used to having that. Mm. One of the good things of social media, though, especially among for some reason among women, young women, I think, is that in, especially Instagram and TikTok, they are encouraging much more much more young people i think than was previously to go and do fizz mm. i think because they see hashtag influencers doing it they want to look good also and they want to that's why you go in the gym and see all the young girls doing those hip thrusts and all they do all do the same you know what i mean Them hip I, thrusts I, I, know, like, I know if, if you look if you looked in a gym like 10 years ago there's a bit like five percent of the people <laughs> doing them now without a doubt but but i think the same as you but i also think at least the fucking in you Oh yeah, yeah, um, and that's doing. like you know. I remember like um, w- when you see people where they'll go, "Oh, CrossFit's crap," or "This is crap," or "This." I'm like that. That's why I would have said before, just just do something. Uh, you know, I like the. I, I don't care if it's the thing I would want to do, as long as you're doing some, do it. I, I can't stand CrossFit. I, I'm, I I can't stand it. Right, but. Like you saying there, such a good thing generally. It has had a net good effect. Yeah, yeah. On the world, I think, for fizz, from getting people out and doing it to getting people part of a community that they may not have been part of before. There are people, and it's one example of a fitness or orientated community, the CrossFit community. You've got high rocks as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. You've got bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah. You've got all these different things. It's an example of those communities are great. They get people being active. Maybe it's not the right thing for all people and they'll move move away from it, but some people may. But the point is they, they start, there are people who are doing fizz now because of CrossFit. Exactly. Because of High Rocks. Because they saw Al Schwarzenegger doing some fucking documentary. And and there were people who would be very much be alone or be extremely mentally ill mm. if it wasn't for these things. They have a real good value. I think there's a lot of like zealots is probably the... the oh, I like that word, zealots. It's a good word. But there's a lot of people out there that think that everything has to be perfect. And they're like, oh, but that isn't the perfect system for or health or whatever and it's like of course it isn't like jujitsu you're trying to break each other's limbs you know or choke each other unconscious you'd go yeah that that sounds like a terrible thing but obviously as long as people are responsible and you know the, the ego uh, like i by the way when i talk about this this is not my gym whatsoever i don't i don't, I don't actually think <laughs> do you know what i had a conversation with someone a while ago and i said I don't think I've ever met a dickhead in our gym. And then they went, do you know what that means? And I was like, what? They were like, you're the dickhead. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like, I think providing everybody's got that in check, then, you know, it's actually, even though the aim is to, to put our joints in places they shouldn't be, actually it's, it's not bad for net bad for people. Like you say, in terms of their joints, it's, it's purely about, um, knowing what you're doing and whatever else, if that makes sense. But I, just going back to where we were, it, there's no perfect system, is there? Like you say, you know, you look at some of the bodies and, and what people's bodies can do. That wouldn't work for us, would it? You know, like look at ultra marathon runners, you know, like that Barkley marathon palaver the the other day. Did you see that? Yeah. So that Barkley Barkley marathon. Do you know what I'm gonna? Barkley. What do you mean Barkley? It's it's called the the Barkley marathon. Right. It's like this this thing in America, and it's. Do you know what I'm gonna? Th- this is where we could do with. Um, some, well, I'm gonna see if I'm gonna gonna say, go on, keep that's, watching. That's on. So basically, it's it's. I think it's widely regarded as one of the hardest races. Like you know, on earth, if you will. It's um, an ultra marathon of, like, put it this way, I think the, the cut-off time to have achieved completing it is 60 hours, if I remember right. Okay. And anyway, the, the first female um, ever completed it the other day, British girl. Um, but, like, if I look at that, like, my hip would be like a wet digestive biscuit in, like, you know, an hour on that. <laughs> It'd just be gone. But, like, for them, it's like, fine, it works. But yeah, you know, the rigors of other things that I might do wouldn't work for that. 
you know, that's that's kind of the key point, isn't it? Is understanding not everything works for everybody, but that's okay. Like we just need to move. If we're moving, Matthew McConaughey calls it breaking a sweat. I think that's an awesome way of referring to, referring it. It's not like you know getting into oh, I have to do such and such a session or like whatever else. Like one of my favorite sessions to do is um, when I walk my dog, I've got like a, um, what's called? I've got a weights vest and I'll just put that on as, and, I, and I'll, you know, have that as a fit session. But I'm, I'm all I'm really doing is just walking my little Frenchie. But you know what I mean? It's, I get some funny looks to be fair because in the middle of summer I'll be carrying her around so I'm wearing these shorts that are like right up here weights vest <laughs> carrying a Frenchie <laughs> people are like what is this guy up to um, but you know as I say that's that's the thing is just just move just break a sweat yeah yeah it is a thing I think um, it's got to start somewhere I think you can, you can end up being people who are like entering into a new thing can be paralyzed but can be paralyzed by not knowing what the right thing is to do as if there is a perfect thing to do yeah. or there's a real concern they're going to do things really wrong and get yeah. fucked up like oh I want to start I want to start weight training how should I do it and then they go online there's a million different articles saying this is the right way to do it this is the wrong way to do it but I think that that is all and that whole attitude online that's all built around people want to wanting to pull people to their brand to sell something oh yeah 100% you know I mean? yeah. especially on the especially like the CrossFit High Rocks is side of things, um, but going back to just going back to jiu-jitsu, that I I think that has to, it's got to be. I, I don't think there's any other sport that comes near to it in terms of uh, uh, mental benefit, community, quality of community, um, and then combined with uh, the comfort zone piece. Yeah, and actual practical benefit. Practical benefit, exactly. Like, generally speaking, you know, the BJJ community, whether it's fucking gi or no gi, whether it's a, you know, Gracie Baja gym or some random independent gym, wherever, generally speaking, I think the BJJ community is so fucking good. So good, so welcoming. Because, and I think that's that purely, well, mainly down to, like, as you mentioned earlier, you spar on every session, and you're trying to choke or break, trying to choke someone out or break a bone. You're literally trying to practice killing someone, yeah, yeah. practice incapacitating them, so you could kill them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's incredibly humbling, incredibly humbling. And on, you know, on a, you know, on a, a fucking white belt's best day, and maybe a blue belt or, or purple belt's worst day, the blue belt, the purple belt could get overcome by someone of a lower belt than them. Oh, of course, you know, yeah. You know what I mean? Out, out of the fucking blue, incredibly humbling. And and also on that mental health aspect, because they all, everyone experiences that same benefit from it, they want to help the worst people, the less experienced people, up the ladder. It's not like, hey, we, we it's not like a, I'm at the top of the tree. No one else will welcome here. I think I, I think there'd be a few. There wouldn't be. I don't think everyone's always as nice to the new guys. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not everyone. Ego is getting away. Maybe. No, I don't think it's ego. I think it's just like you know again. We we all want to have fun now and again, don't mm. we? Like I mean, to be fair, I I don't gen. I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm not good enough to do this anyway. But um, nah, like I think you know, it's like you say. You can tell by how someone like <clears throat> grip you or how they would do something if they're new or not. Um, you know, you can just tell, and then you can kind of go, okay, you know. And this and like you say though, that's where the beauty of the sport comes as well. Because like say say if I'm rolling with black belt. You know, they could tap me 10 times in a round if they wanted to. But what, you know, some of them, not all will do, but some, they, they'll let you work, you know. So like, because again, if they don't let you work, then they don't get anything out of it. So they can still get something out of it by letting you work, even though you're much worse than they, you know, like you'd never be able to do that in football really, would you? Because you can't just be like, oh, play a really good pass there. It's just not practical. Whereas in in um, Jiu Jitsu, if they kind of leave you an opening, if you can take that opening, then okay, you can f oops, you can follow that, can't you? It's also the vulnerability side of it. So when when when, when you aspire and you get caught up in a in a chokehold, you get caught, caught up in a, um in a 
in a an arm bar, an arm yeah, bar, yeah, something yeah. like that. The vulnerability you experience there of knowing you're pretty much totally fucked. There's nothing you can do. Just got a year, and you're entirely <laughs> like literally at that moment, even in tra- you know in a, in a session in sparring, you're entirely in the hands. Your well-being is in the hands of that person's got hold of you. There's a trust and the vulnerability side. I think the the thing is as well, like with with grappling, um, and this is something you've got to be very personally aware of as well. Is um, like when it comes to levels, it's um, like certain submissions. The you can't do certain submissions on certain levels purely because if they do the wrong thing, they will injure themselves. You know, so like a lot of things to do with legs, mm. you're not supposed to do on white belts. Not everyone would do that, but you know, you're not supposed to do it just get like, you know, for instance, a heel hook. Like you're not supposed to do that on a white belt because if they turn the wrong way, their knee will explode. But you know, it's, and that that's a big responsibility as well. Like you, you know, you have to have, it, again, like you say, a minute ago, you could have someone who was, you know, Maybe, let's say, say if you had someone who's like a brown belt, so, you know, up up there, high proficiency, but they're maybe a bit lighter. And then they've let a white belt who's maybe, you know, 100 kilo plus work. You could have been on the bottom getting absolutely smashed, as in your face mashed in or what have you. They're not, you're not in danger of getting submitted, per se, but it's going to be very uncomfortable. You've got to have so much control because then when you get through that gap and you know you then like you could quite easily really hurt somebody um and like you say the the way in which you have to carry yourself is very important but yeah like you say massive level of vulnerability to be fair and what's good about it as well it's not it's not striking Mm -hmm. which is which is good um you know because i think that's a lot off-putting for a lot of off-putting for a lot of people if they want to get into um a martial art they don't fancy getting punched in the face or kicked in the I mean, you still do get hit inadvertently, you know, like, because you're not going to necessarily be in a position where you're the only people on the mat. And for example, say someone tries to grab your head. I've had about four black eyes now where they've just poked me in the eye, (laughs) which again is quite, it's quite an interesting opener. Say if I've got to go and do some training. So I'm like, hi, so about this black eye. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, like you say, you know, it's, it's not, you're not going to get your lights punched out, so to speak. Um, and, you know, hypothetically, you should be able to train without injuring yourself, hypothetically. I mean, should touch some wood there, shouldn't I, somewhere? Is that, no, that's metal. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch this one. <laughs> um, yeah, you should. Um, but, yeah, uh, it's it's just such a good actor. It's, it's massively growing in the military as well. You know, so ITDG, um, we... we try and support as many army sports as we can you know so i'll I'll go down do a pop-up um and when i say do a pop-up yeah i bring stash you know so people can buy stash but again i don't just go and be like buy a t-shirt you know i've got all of the uh, material that we would give out and I, i i spend half the day talking to people where i'll say you're familiar with the brand you know and if they aren't i'll go through you know, I don't talk about the merch. I talk about like what this is all about. Um, so yeah, both, which is Army CrossFit. Um, that that's um, what's it called? Both British Army Warrior Fitness. Okay. Or it's it, you know, I t- to be fair, I, to to give it its official thing, it's not Army CrossFit per se, but it's <clears throat> applying the Army system of physical training in the same manner. You know, you, you, you're using a lot of CrossFit type things, um, but it'd probably be wrong for me to say it is CrossFit. Do you know what I mean? Because the the usually every time there's like a burger run of some description, which isn't a massive go to move in CrossFit. Or oh, sorry, yeah, event. Who's running that? Um, it, it's it's ram within um, a, a lot of PT core guys um, are like he- headed up, if you will. There's a um, PT core guy who used to be Power Edge, but he he's got his own fizz company. That's called Warrior Fitness. I was just wondering if it, Warrior Fitness or Warrior Strong. One of the two. I was wondering if he was involved, but and he, his 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 that Warrior Fitness is all it's basically weighted fizz for civvies. Yeah, 
Well, oh, it's, 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 it's not um it's not always that as such, but there is usually mm. a green element, you know, so you'll have some sort of you know, depending on where you are, because obviously if it was a unit that's got a pool, they, they'd utilise the pool as well, just for, for that type of thing. But yeah, th those two sports are, are generally what I support. Not that I don't support others, it's just they're the ones I, I'll be invited to events. events sorry, I do he health fairs as well. Um, so again, you know, I'll go and, and talk um, to people about the topic, uh, as well as obviously bringing a little pop-up shop as well. What about the uh, Army, B Army BB... Army BJJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went. I did the Army BJJ Championships. I'm going to do a pop up at um, the Armed Forces Veterans Emergency Services and Prison Services event in Aldershot. Is that what it's called? It is actually. Called that. <laughs> it is actually called that. that is the, when is that? Uh, the first of June. Right. Which will be quite interesting. I'm going to have to get someone to help me though because I'm going to compete as well. Right. So I'm going to be like, like you know. I'll, I'll have a few matches. Well, you know, maybe one one game, one no game, but hopefully more than that. Um, but yeah, so I'll be competing, but also um, I'll have the pop up there as well. So I'll have someone to come down and um, work the stand for me. Mm. What's uh, what's next for the company? You were talking, you were talking off air about potential for a podcast, but you didn't sound too too <laughs> key. You weren't sure. No, nah, it's not that I'm not sure. In that, I think. Um, it's probably something that I should explore. Um, you know, it's it's all it's been an aspiration for a while. Um, I think probably the the key barrier is the editing piece, which I'm sure is probably the the a challenging element for you. Like obviously this part, you know, I imagine ninety nine point nine percent of the time is is good for you, um, but then I imagine the challenge again. You can obviously say what it, it, whether it is or it isn't, but for me, that's one of the barriers is is doing the editing part myself. I, I think I don't know whether it's just another skill to learn, isn't it? It's like that's a lot of the depends on it depends on the end, what end product you want, right? So you think about this in terms of editing of this actual interview, there is none. Yeah. No, I'll 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 top and tail it. I'll put an, for the audio version. I'll put an intro on. Yeah. I'll put an outro on. Yeah. Um, but they're the same for every podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the middle, I don't edit it. The only time I ever edit in the middle is if there's a piece of information said that is for some upset, comset reason needs to be bleeped or silenced out. Yeah. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I find the the most time consuming thing for for me with this. Um, the most pain in the ass thing for me for this, and I say pain in the ass because this is again a bit like what you mentioned earlier. It's a side hustle, you know. I'm lucky not. I'm lucky not to rely on it. Not to need to rely on this to as a source of income. But but I am emotionally invested in it, which means I want to throw time at it. Yeah, yeah. And for me, the more obviously I want to throw time at it. We're just sitting you now fucking doing this, right? But for me, the, the thing that most takes the most time. And is the most effort is putting is the social media side. Yeah, which which part of the interview should I clip and publish? How should I publish it? What should I? How should I word the word? How should I word the po the the description of the video I'm posting? Where should I post it? What time should I put all of that stuff? Because I'm used to it as it all at all right, and now I I don't I don't even select the clips myself. There's a piece of software I use which automatically creates clips for me oh okay 10 of them from the episode and I go yeah I'm just gonna put that and with the tra with the transcript and everything so that I've just started recently doing that so and it's deliberate I could spend time and go agonising over which bit to put out that'd be where you, a producer would be oh, dead on the order because then, you, then they can go yeah that, exactly, was, that was great exactly. that was great I want that, that bit like, ideally it's do this piece okay hand it over there's the content I want the podcast out of this. Again, I don't want any editing. Yeah. But a producer of the social media, fucking right, take what you want, post what you want. It's a bit like um, on Jocko podcast, Echo does that, doesn't he? Uh, Echo Charles, the, his co host. Okay. I think, from what I understand, he's the tech guy, so he does right. the edit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then, but then when I think about that effort and I agonize over that, I do agonize a lot over I'm not promoting this podcast effectively. But then I catch myself on that with 
well, why why am I agonizing about that? This isn't why are you stressing about it? If mm. I don't put anything out on social media next week I'll post about this interview or whenever the interview goes out, yeah, it'll piss me off. But actually, what does it mean to me in terms of tangible problem? Not a lot. I won't be happy and I'll feel like I'm doing you a disservice. I feel like I'm doing a disservice to people who may benefit from whatever clip I'm going to put out. But really, do I need to be agonizing about it over, over it so much as I am? Mm-hmm. And the answer is no, which is why I've gone to that. Okay, let's just use the clips that have been created automatically and put those out because doing that is better than doing nothing. You know, it'd be a different kettle of fish if this was what I did for a living. Yeah, but then, if this is what I did for a living, like you said, I'd have a producer. Yeah. <laughs> Social media. Yeah. And all I'd have to worry about is is talking to each guest. Yeah. Yeah, I think like, there's definitely, again, I suppose as well, with the podcast part, I suppose the, <clears throat> the interesting part for me, what I'd love to do, but again, I think that, that this would create a barrier with getting guests is I'd love to have people on, you know, like yourself, who you've alluded to having had challenges in the past. I think it'd be really great if we could kind of not explore them to the point where it's like, right, tell me all the trauma and all the. But what I mean is I think it'd be great to have people where they'll, um, they, they need to be comfortable enough to be vulnerable to then go, right, this is what I've experienced. It doesn't have to be the, the depths of detail. The only reason being, so people will look at them and go, bloody hell, you, you know, parad sniper, blah, blah, blah. If, he, if he's happy to talk, then maybe I'm happy to talk. And I think, you know, it, it would probably be more just comfortable being vulnerable. That, that'd be the thing, you know, because that, that's where I find, when I deliver training, you know, I'll give my story, if you will. Like my mental health stuff, and I always call it stuff, is re- related to anxiety, depression, and whatever else. But it's, I don't, I thoroughly don't believe it has anything to do with trauma and service. So even though, you know, s- stuff like what we were talking about earlier at the start of the podcast, you know, it's that's the type of stuff that you go, that is mad stuff. That is stuff that, like, for the vast majority of humans, they're like, can't even comprehend it for, you know. But for me, that hasn't exhibited a trauma response. But, um, you know, like for me, basically, I had a string of events happen in my life, um, which started with my dad having a stroke, um, which left him hemiplegic, which means only half his body is is function. So he's in, in a wheelchair. What, left or right? Is it hemi, is that? Hemiplegic. So just basically uh, his left hand side of his body um, ha- hasn't functioned. I've never heard that word before. That it, it's a posh way of just saying, it, it's it's what most people who, you know, if somebody's had a stroke that has resulted in them having a disability afterwards, that's what most people, and it usually affects one side or the other. With strokes, it's, um, and again, I'm not a doctor on this, I just remember what I was told. So you'll get some, like you get some people who make a full recovery, of course. Um, but then for some people it might be, like I remember there was a guy who was in the hospital when my dad was. So he he um, could walk, but he couldn't talk. So it affected his speech, whereas my dad's <clears throat> fine talking and whatever else. But as I say, his whole left hand side just doesn't work. So yeah, that kind of was like the kicker, it, it began. But as I say, I think I've, I, I've, I've had poor mental health most of my adult life. And when I think as in like the way I interpreted situations and I'd be like, are they, do they not like me? Have, have I done something wrong or, and this would all be internal by the way. Um, and then, you know, after that with my dad anyway, uh, you know, my mum, um, she, she had a real steep decline in her mental health. Um, then shortly after that, a friend of mine, a Sibby friend died. And then basically I was away and literally I'd become obsessed with my health, like obsessed. And when I say obsessed, I'm talking like, if I had a little twinge in my chest, um, I'd be like, I'm gonna have a heart attack. I'd, I'd be like, I'd be convinced I was having a heart attack or, you know, say if, uh, like, I don't know, say when you're shaving, and you get like a, um, you feel a little lump, you know, like your, your glands. I'd be like, have I got cancer? And all this type of stuff. And, you know, 
basically whenever I give a, a, a course, I always begin with that because it's mad how many people straight away they're comfortable talking about this stuff. You know, people will be like, hi, my name's so-and-so. Um, I've tried to kill myself before. And like literally that's on the introduction. And that's where, going back to it, I think the more of people who can hear those types of stories, again, not in, it doesn't have to be gory deep. It just needs to be people going, wow, I respect that guy. I've got a lot, you know, I can do that. If he can do that, I can do that. I think, yeah, I think one of the, yeah, I agree. I, um, I think one of the, I think one of the barriers to people, um, not one of the barriers, I think one of the reasons that people can have a mental mental health issue go on for far too long before they actually do something about it um, or say something about it is because they incorrectly think that their, their situation is a rare one. Yeah. That no one else, especially for guys, no one else around them feels like this or has felt like this and they'll be and they'll and they're like a, you're like an outcast because of like that. Or, or again you're the weak you'll be perceived as weak or any of those things and it's totally incorrect mm. you know um, and that again is the power is the power of talking about these things yeah i remember when i it was a couple of years after i started this and i sort of realized the impact that me talking about my mental health when i started when i one of the reasons i started the podcast was similar to what you're talking about yours is is i wanted to I wanted to help other people through difficult things in life, right? Just not by not by preaching, not not by being, being a messiah or anything, but by simply talking about my experiences or, or hearing other people talk about their experiences. It's like a reference book, then, isn't it? Yeah, be it be it problem starting a bit or hard hardship starting a business or hardship getting through fucking life emotionally, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, and and so people, I was hoping people would learn from that and they would go through life a bit better from learning. The stuff that I learned, but without having to go through the difficult times that I yeah. did, right? Um, and I remember going to a, an event in Hereford, and there was a guy who was a, a, a guy there who was ex Hereford, ex Parage guy who I know, uh, Ben from HR4K. HR4, you know HR4K. Yeah, yeah. It was Ben. It's one of his events at his venue. Went there, and this guy who turned up who was from Three Para, who I, obviously I used to be part of, and I hadn't seen him for years. When we were serving, he was a couple of ranks below me, and. He rocked up, and he said, "I've listened to your podcast." Da, 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 da. I said, "Fucking cool!" I said, "How's tricks, mate?" And he and he, he responded by he wasn't good. He said, I, "I fucking I ain't fucking good at all." And I thought afterwards, I was thinking about it. I thought he wouldn't have given me that response if he hadn't have listened to the podcast, and heard me talking about it, mm-hmm. and and it and and so I was glad about that. But then I remember back to before he'd even started the podcast, and similar to you, I started this up with a business partner, well, a podcast partner. He he stayed for 10 episodes and then left after. Just didn't, he didn't fancy taking, doing it anymore. Jared, his name is good, really good lad. And um, when we were starting on it, I said to myself, kind of, all right, I said to myself, you know, to talk to myself, you know that if you do this, it's only going to be worth doing if you were open to talking openly about your experiences, which I hadn't done to that point. Mm. I wasn't comfortable talking out must, loud about my stuff at all. That must have been a a, bar- a big barrier for you to, over, you know, to go... It, it was, but again, it was that accountability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I knew yeah. was valuing it. Yeah. Because in, to- in me talking to other people, and like we're doing today, we talk, even just touching the subjects of our own mental ill health experiences... It means I am thinking about my own stuff that I've experienced in the past, and so processing it more and understanding it more. You know, which again, I, we just don't fucking do. So much value in it. I feel like I, like, and this is why I say why I said I feel like I've experienced this most of my life because I can reflect on situations <clears throat> in the past and think, man, if I if I like you know had any insight on this topic when I was younger. And that, that's why I do what I do now, by the way, because I'm quite aware that situation I was talking about earlier, there was, I must have been awful to work with because when I was, because, you know, I was, I was having a bit of trouble with the person we were working for, you know, which happens in any walk of life. It's just obviously more exacerbated when you are out of the country and you have to be with that person all the time. But, um, you know, I have no doubt my mates who I worked with at the time must have been like, oh my God, did they, you know, this is a nightmare. 
which is a fair thing for them to say. But actually, if somebody have had a bit of training, a bit of understanding, yeah, I'd have had a better time. But so would everyone else. Like the health, the health of organisations, the performance of people and organisations can be so much higher just by having an insight on this topic. They don't need to be experts, but they just need to go, hmm, is there something, why is this happening? This this feels different, you know, because let's face it, employees don't go from being good employees to not so good employees for no reason. It's just, you don't just wake up one day and go, do you know what, I'm going to be difficult now. That is one of the, that is one of the, the positive changes that has happened over the last 15, 20 years, maybe a bit longer. I think, you, you, well, you'll know this because of the, you know, the training clipper. Positive changes in the corporate environment is that they have woken up to the fact that your business is more profitable if your workforce are happier. Mm. It's just, you know, so, and what that means is you should take steps to monitor the happiness of your workforce and ensure that you can impact the happiness of the workforce in general. Mental, mental health first aid, it's exactly one of the reasons why mental health first aiders exist. It's not yeah. because companies all of a sudden said, want to be oh, friendly. we really want to look after yeah. our staff now. No, what the first thing happened is they realised that, hey, we get more profit if they're happier. Yeah, yeah. They work better if they're happier. But, but <laughs> so also, now they're more invested in keeping employees happy. <laughs> it's it's again it's logical. Like if we can, you know, obviously the aim is to help people in the sense of like we don't want people, you know, we don't want people to take their own life. You know that that nobody does. But the the thing that is like you say, if you can get over the barrier of like the the old and bold, I would say, of like. You know, say if someone takes a mental health day, so to speak, people would be like, you know, you I, you can see it, can't you? People going, ah, why are they doing that? But then they don't realise that. Say if say if you had one mental health day a month, even one a month, that is still much better than somebody having none. What do you mean mental health? Day? So, for example, if they had an absence that was related to poor mental health. You know, like for argument's sake, and again, I'm, th- this is just an example. Like, if somebody was like, "Do you know what? I'm too anxious to come to work for whatever reason. You know, or I've, I'm stressed, or, or whatever it might be." That, like, because again, you know, there'll be a lot of people probably pursing their lips at this. You know, looking at me like, "What are you on about? What? That that's ridiculous." But if we think about it in a bigger picture sense, if somebody, all right, say someone goes right. I need two weeks off because because I'm I'm too stressed. Then not just a day, if you will, two weeks. That's still better than if they were to leave it and then have to take six months off. Which, if you have bigger absences, you know, related to depression, like in the army, I remember pretty much whenever somebody went off with depression, they were off for six months minimum. That was like standard. So what what I'm getting at is, like you say, companies have woken up to okay, well actually it's better if they have. A, you know, one day off a month, two weeks off here or there, than having the, the, it get to that point where it's like, okay, you're off for six months. It's it's a drastic issue. The only problem with this stuff is that it's it's really easy to implement and uh, implement and uh, accommodate for bigger businesses. Oh it's yeah, not for smaller businesses. No, no, you no. know, in a in a small business of four people yeah, or those, even eight people those carpet one fitters person, I was on about yeah, yeah, yeah. one person takes a day off that's 25% of the work yeah, yeah. quite often that small nothing can be done if yeah. one of the people's off like the day whole fucking day is written off and so um, and so unfortunately I can't solve that no, you know, no it's like, difficult <laughs> it, I mean I mean that it's difficult that some things are unsolvable, right? Yeah. Well, it's, and again, I, I would be doing, like, I'd just end up waffling if I tried to do that. You know, again, context and case by case is important, isn't it? Um, but in that case, I suppose that the key thing is just trying to be able to actively manage the system. You know, uh, what it, can you do? Like, there's a, there's a form that I advise people to implement, which is called a wellness action plan. Um, basically, a wellness action plan is like, a person, I, you know, you you identify between you and a manager um, that you have poor or you live with poor mental health or you have a diagnosis of whatever it might be. 
And then what you can do is you can actually come to a agreement of saying, okay, first of all, this is what it looks like. You know, like for example, for me, if I'm having a bad time mentally, first of all, I the way I often refer to it is my head, my brain doesn't feel right is, is the, the way I explain it because that's how it feels to me, which sounds silly to some people. But for me, that is the way it feels because I'll be like that nothing nothing has to be different. I don't have to have had this bit. I can just sit there and be like, brain doesn't feel right today. Doesn't mean that my way I go about my day changes, by the way, it's just that. Uh, and then, you know, I might do things like, I'll be checking my pulse more frequently because I'll probably be having palpitations or, you know, I might be um, complaining of some sort of issue. I might have a headache, that type of thing. Um, but generally, for a lot of people, they wouldn't know. But what you can do is, is you can tell your manager about this so they can then go spot the early warning signs. You then talk about what should they do? What's the best thing to do? And then it creates a, a sort of system where, you know, if we look at those smaller companies, actually, if, if people, again, in an ideal world, if they're able to have that conversation, they're more likely to be able to be to actively manage the issue with their employer and less likely to be absent. That's kind of like the way I would think about it. Yeah, I think the smaller companies as well, I think the main main thing is uh, is knowledge, understanding, education of whoever the boss is. Yeah. Because they're much more, if, you know, if you've got a more on boss in a smaller company, it's much more obvious of an impact on people, direct impact than it is in a large company. But, 100%. Um, wait, we've got about few minutes a few minutes left yeah um so apart from the podcast oh you should start to my advice on the podcast right if you're if you're mulling it over it's just fucking get something done so get two or three people guests if you're going to do it like a, if everyone's going to be a guest get two or three people line them up and say hey will you come in and do like a, a trial podcast i may release it and may not mm-hmm. i want to test it just to see if it's worthwhile doing to get two or three it could even just be one yeah one, two or three people in to get it done whether it's in person or it's online then do that and go, hmm, did I enjoy it? Do I think it's worthwhile investing in time in it? And do I think it's providing quality to people who could listen to it? Do, just do that. Yeah. You know what it's like? Cause sometimes you just like, right, just fucking do it and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. You know oh, I, mean? I mean, that's, do you know what? That's kind of been how I've, like, you know, like I said before, I, I can be a bit loose. That's kind of like how I've started, you know, that was how I started the brand in the first place. Like, you know, in reality, that was how I'd left the army. Like, I left the army because I, w- I was going to go in, um, I wanted to go in into the PT call. Um, and then one day I was on holiday and this is going to be the most absurd reason for leaving the army I've ever had. Anyway. <laughs> I was on holiday and I thought, do you know what? I'd love to have a caravan when I'm uh, like at home, you know, like in, in Wales somewhere. I was like, I'd love to have a caravan. And then I thought, do you know what? I'd never be able to go there because I'd be in the army and I'd be commuting all the time. And that was when I said, I need to leave the army. <laughs> Fucking caravan. And I haven't got a caravan. <laughs> I haven't got one. But that was that was what made me um decide it was time. So maybe this was the this is the caravan moment for the caravan podcast. Yeah, let's do it, mate. I, I, you know, if they're all I think it would have to be a real dog shit podcast did you, for no one to get benefit from it. Did you still have a shed that you did yours out of, if I remember rightly, or did like what the ven used to have a venue. I just, I've just i got my own studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm at the move at the minute. So I'm, it's going to storage for a bit. I say yeah. the storage, get moved to a storage place for a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was mega. That was mega. Um, but bags, bare arms. Very, very, um, very uh, generously. Let's use this place. Yeah, Do mega. Because not far away. Immense. But um, you don't have to have your own spot. No, no. And, 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 and on virtual interviews are, are, are fine. Mm. You know, from the most part, an in person is always better a better experience, especially you know, well, for a, a million fucking obvious reasons. Yeah, but virtual is 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 just as fine these days. You don't doesn't take a lot of money to set up. It takes hardly anything. In fact, hardly anything. If anything, if you've got a laptop already, you can start it like that. You know, um, it, it's people are much more palatable these days of less than professional studio quality because and COVID's partly. Sounds of that because people just getting used to online. Everything was online. Yeah. Everything was on. If you remember pre-COVID, 
it was not common to have interviews on the BBC or S4C, S4C is a Welsh channel, Channel 4, ITV, yeah, whatever, yeah. which were the interviewer is in one office and the interviewee is in another office. They were almost always in the studio. Unless it was cross-continent or countries, obviously. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, they were almost, almost always in the studio. These days, you get people getting interviewed and they're on their phone. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And so people are much more palatable, with less than studio quality audio. Mm-hmm. The audio just needs to be, the audio needs to be of good enough quality that it isn't not good to listen to. Yeah. You know, like loads of background noises. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it, the main focus is on the content. Yeah, what, yeah. What is being said, you know? And every word, well, obviously, lots of words we've been talking about, they aren't high quality, but the general conversation is good. You know, um, it's authentic. Neither of us are towing some edit- unseen editorial line. You know, we're not trying to peddle fucking Juice snake plus. oil on people <laughs> or, you know, whatever. And that, 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 that's it. And, and you know, as long as there's a, a clear intent and people know what they're subscribed to and for, then it's... Yeah. Good mate, do it. Do yeah. it. You know, it sounds like you'll be a success anyway. Got, the idea of interview I don't think you'd have any problem finding guests to talk about their mental health journey. Mm. Um certainly not. Uh yeah, I suppose actually once you've got a couple in, then it's then it's different, isn't it? You know what I mean? But yeah. 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 Thank thank you, Hugh. No problem, mate. And if I can help with it in any way, you know, more more than happy to help. Not a yeah. drama at all. Amazing. Um Right, how do people follow the rant? Uh, so if you go to Instagram, TikTok, um, and or if you were to put it into Facebook, it's just all the words in the dead ground. You're not on X? Uh, do you know what? I think I have a, um, what's it called? I think I have a profile, but I found when I've been on, when I was on that personally in the past, I just, I found I was just shouting into the void a bit too much. Like at that, you know, I find more engagement off Instagram's the main community area because I, I got TikTok to try it out, if you will. But I'm still learning that. But yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say we've got a presence on X other than a profile. I feel like if you can get it right, your brand would do well on there. It's okay, different, it's different. You've got to treat it differently than all the other talking. Yeah, about. yeah. But um, okay, in their ground, and then what about corporate? Uh, mental health first aid training. Um, well, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn, Daniel Bourne. I've do, I do have a um, I do have a company. It's called. It's a bit. It's a bit of a gobful actually. I need to rebrand it slightly. Is it as much of a gobful as that BJJ event down in? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that'd be possible. I might have even forgotten one of the services there. So to be fair, uh, no. So it, it, it's just I call it Catalyst. Do Catalyst develops optimization, but as I say, it is a bit of a gobful. But hang on, say that again. Catalyst. Develops optimization. Catalyst develops, develops optimi- optimization. So think about it, Hugh. I'm what, trying. <laughs> what's the What's the initials? CDO. Yeah. Commando. I, I oh, want. I want. Fucking loser. I wanted to have. I wanted to have a nod, but not like a you know, regain or like. Yeah, it's not as no. It's, it sounds fine. There was a one of the early guests I had was a guy called Jim James Bro, and. Uh, the the company he was working for at the time is called TMT, Tango Mike Tango, and I said, okay, why is it called TMT? And the answer was, him and his business partners came up with they're the money team, the money team. It was a construction firm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the money apparently apparently Floyd Mayweather. That's oh yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, anyway. But yeah, I'd say for for the corporate. I mean, you know, you can, I don't push the mental health first aid stuff via the brand per se but I think you know going back to your final question before that's where I'm I'm gonna go is just amalgamate everything not so much that it's gonna be like trying to sell mental health first aid on it's it's probably more the other way that I'll talk about the work I do within the dead ground on LinkedIn more if that makes sense but there's no harm no, no, I, but as I say, it's that's probably more the next steps is just to tra- just amalgamate everything, and then it, it it all becomes one thing rather than it looking like putting different, you know, because I do all of this anyway, so it's not like I'm doing, yeah. anything, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's natural cost over there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then the, it's not like you know I'm selling one thing and then you know something completely 
incongruent on the other hand, is it? Well, they, no, you, you're, already, the same you're already selling products out of service to it. Yeah. Which is the mental health first aid trainer. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, as I say, like, I, I, th- I mean, I have done a mental health first aid course through in the dead ground. So I did it as an evening course for people. Um, I've just not revisited it mm. since. But, you know, I've, I've done that in the past, to be fair. Mm. Mate, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me on. Good, uh, good luck with everything. And um, let us know if you uh, go down the podcast route. Will do. Absolutely. And if you do, we'll come back on again, mate. We'll yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. 100%.